You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. I'm going to let you in on a few little secrets that you need to know. Delta. Delta. The name of the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. In form, it is a triangle and was considered by the ancient Egyptians a symbol of fire and also of God. In the Scottish and French systems and also that of the Knights Templar, the triangle or delta is the symbol of the unspeakable name. I-N-R-I. In effect, Jesus, Nazarenus, Rex, Edirum, which means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The inscription which was placed upon the cross of the Savior. In the philosophical lodge, they represent fire, salt, sulfur, and mercury. In the system of the Rosicrucians, they had a similar use. Igne, Natura, Renovature Integra, which literally transfer means by fire, nature is perfectly renewed. This idea is also found in the degree of knights, adepts of the eagle or the sun. Don't go away. From the Rose Cross College which is a resume of the teachings and proceedings of the Rose Cross College during its session held in the month of October 1916 on the 400th anniversary of the founding of the Order, the Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi, its instructions and the official degree, Priests of Melchizedek, the Knights of Chivalry, and Order of the Holy Grail. Edited by R. Swineburne Clymer, October and copyrighted 1917, published at Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. At the close of the June convocation of the Rose Cross Order and Sacred College, it became evident that a convocation of the Sacred College and the Order of the Magi would be necessary in October in order to continue the work and commemorate the anniversary of the foundation of the Rose Cross Order dating from the year 1516. On the second day of June, special letters of invitation were mailed to all members privileged to be present at the October convocation and arrangements started so that not only might lectures be given every day during the entire month of October while the college was in session, but that ancient degrees, sons of Osiris, might also be conferred as they had been during the month of June upon the delegates then present. Information had been received at headquarters from different sources that men without any authority whatever were using the name of the Magi, men who were not and never had been on the rolls of the order. Acting upon this information, it was considered best that special effort should be made to convene the order during the sacred college session, and when convened, the official degree, Priests of Melchizedek, should be conferred upon all who were eligible. During July, it became evident that if the work in several large cities were to go forward, leaders should be officially ordained. With this in view, the following notices were mailed to the members of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated. My dear brother, in accordance with the power vested in me as President of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated, and at the request of the Order of the Illuminati, degree Knights of the Rose Cross, I herewith invite you to be present at a special session of the Association to begin October 1st and end October 30th, 1916. At this special session of the Association, a convening of the Sacred Rose Cross College shall be called, and besides the regular work of the College when in session, the special work of ordaining two members of the fraternity, namely Mr. Charles C. Brown, Buffalo, New York, and Mr. A. W. Witt, Kansas City, Missouri, in accordance with the provision in the bylaws of the corporation to wit. Quote, This corporation shall have the power to call a convocation at any time and when so convened shall have the power to select teachers and to ordain such teachers to the ministry as shall in their opinion be fitted for the position. And such ordained men shall have the power and the right to officiate at weddings and at funerals and possess all such other powers as ministers of God usually possess. In accordance with the laws made and provided for in our corporation, we issue this invitation that you may be present. God be with you. Fraternally yours. Signed, R. Swainburne, Clymer, President. All arrangements having been completed during the months of July, August, and September, the delegates began arriving on the last day of September and on the first day of October, 
nearly all had arrived who were to be present during the first session. On October the 2nd, the Sacred College was called to order and lectures being given in the forenoon, afternoon, and evening of each day by those who had prepared papers. Before the morning lecture, a private session was held, presided over by Charles C. Brown of the Buffalo College, and conducted in the manner of the private classes at College in Buffalo, New York. On the evening of October the 11th, all the delegates repaired to the Grove of Osiris, where the three degrees, ancient mysteries of Osiris, were conferred upon those delegates not previously initiated. The music, especially prepared for the entire ritual, being furnished by Miss Daisy T. Grove of Buffalo, New York. After these ceremonies, all repaired to the hall, where a dinner was served to all. On the night of the 12th of October, the delegates met in the Rose Cross Chapel, and after the Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi had opened in due form and finished its official business, the official degree Priests of Melchizedek was conferred upon all those present. Following the conferring of this degree, the Council closed in a special official session of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated, was called to order. After the opening of the business session of the association, the official letter mailed to members was read by the acting secretary, Miss Vera H. Barr, and approved by officers and members present. It was then moved and seconded that Mr. A. W. Witt of Kansas City, Missouri, should be ordained to the ministry in harmony with the corporate powers. Mr. Witt was called upon to make his confession of faith and allegiance to the Church of Illumination and to read the thesis prepared for that purpose. The ordination in due form followed. After the ordination of Mr. Witt, the following resolutions passed by the officers of the corporation in special session on March 10, 1916, were officially approved by all members present. First, because certain people without authority from this corporation or from the true Rose Cross order long established in America have started organizations calling themselves Rosicrucian, but without any Rosicrucian teachings, and directly in conflict with Rosicrucian laws and usages, it has become urgent that the Royal Fraternity Association shall issue a certificate of membership good for one year to every student who enrolls with any one or other of such orders or fraternities. The fee for such membership certificates shall be 25 cents to cover cost of issue and clerk hire. At the expiration of one year, the holder thereof shall make application for a new certificate. All such certificates shall be on record in the office of the President of the Corporation. Any student expelled from the order makes void his certificate unless reinstated. Any member of any body in fraternal relation with the Royal Fraternity Association may, on the payment of a fee of 25 cents, have a certificate issued to him recognized by the fraternities affiliated with this corporation. These rules to go into effect immediately. It is regrettable that such rules and regulations are necessary. Not less than six different associations have sprung in existence calling themselves Rosicrucian, without a shred of Rosicrucian teachings, and three other associations calling themselves Magi or Melchizedek, without any authority of any Magi, and all of them years after the institution of the legitimate bodies. Furthermore, when six members of the Black Brotherhoods have enrolled in the true fraternities within a year to gain secrets to be used by the Black Brotherhoods, we realize the importance of strict rules. For this reason, the Royal Fraternity Association as a protecting body became a necessity. Following the session of the Imperialistic Council of the Magi and the session of the Royal Fraternity Association, a midnight dinner, the October Feast of the Gods, was partaken of by those present. On the night of October 13th, after the opening of the official session of the corporation, the following resolution, voiced by the chairman and seconded by Reverend A.W. Witt, was passed. Under the Royal Fraternity Association, during the convocation of the Sacred College, that the Order of Knighthood, known as Knights of Chivalry, Order of the Holy Grail, be reinstituted, that at this meeting one Sir Knight should be created by the Grand Sir Knight, and that this Sir Knight should select his lady for the coming year, and that during the year following this Sir Knight should select men either within or without the order, that at the next June convocation of the Sacred College, such men selected by him, and not more than nine, attend the Sacred College convocation and be created knights. Those in turn to select their ladies, either from within or without the order, but from within if possible. Only men of the highest standing to be selected, men of the highest moral character, 
men chivalry towards womanhood. Each man must study and be familiar with the labors of chivalry, legends of the Holy Grail or Holy Graal, and the Golden Fleece of the Jason Society. After the first year that a certain number of men worthy of the honor be selected, also ladies to the same number, the total of men knights not to exceed 199 during the first seven years. That the first one to be selected and created a Sir Knight be August Rue, spelled R-H-U, medical doctor of Marion, Ohio, because of high attainments in his profession and the favorable aspects of the heavens to his nativity and of the prophecy made by those who know. Biography, August Rue, Marion, Ohio, Specialty Surgery and Gynecology. Born in Seneca County, Ohio. Graduated from Western Reserve University, Medical Department, Cleveland, Ohio, 1885. Fellow American College of Surgeons, 1914. Yearly special course in surgery and medicine since 1885. Is also an author. Immediately upon the passing of these articles, Dr. Rue was created a Sir Knight and selected as his lady-in-waiting for the year, M. Alice Reese, spelled R-E-E-S-E, -E -E, of Kansas City, Missouri, who was then knighted as a lady. R. Swinburne Clymer, as Grand Sir Knight, was ordered to prepare rules and regulations for the Sir Knights after ancient usages. On the 15th day of October, the first session of the Sacred College came to a close, and the delegates returned to their homes. The officers remained for the second session. The second session of the Sacred College was called to order on the 16th of October, at which time the delegates had arrived for the second session. Lectures at once began and continued for the rest of the month. On the evening of the 17th of October, those present repaired to the Grove of Osiris and had conferred upon them the ancient degrees of Osiris in like manner as that conferred upon the delegates of the first session. The midnight dinner, Feast of the Gods, followed the conferring of the degrees, followed by the usual social session. On the night of the 18th of October, the delegates and officers repaired to the Rose Cross Temple, and after the imperialistic council of the Magi had come to order, the ancient degree, Priests of Melchizedek, was conferred upon them. After closing the temple in due form, an official session of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated, was called to order. Charles C. Brown of Buffalo, New York, was brought before the session and requested to make his confession of faith and allegiance to the Church of Illumination and read his thesis. He was then ordained to the ministry in due form. After Mr. Brown had been ordained and the business of the corporation brought to a close, a dinner was served to those present. Lectures continued thrice daily with a special session, each forenoon, led by Rev. C.C. C. Brown until the night of October 24th, when word was received that Joseph A. Walter, 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Buffalo, New York Consistory, A.A. Scottish Rite, a brother of the order, Fraternity Sons of Osiris, would arrive that day. On his arrival, the Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi convened, and the ancient degree Priest of Melchizedek was conferred upon Mr. Walter, followed by the official dinner in his honor. Of the lectures given during the month of October, only a limited number can be given. The dedication service to be used in all ceremonies of ordination to the ministry in the Church of Illumination was prepared by the writer some years ago and symbolic of the path taken by the neophytes desiring to reach illumination. The article concerning the Magi and the work on the order of knighthood, with exceptions as noted, are from the same pen. With the exception of the Church of Illumination, the thesis prepared by Rev. Charles C. Brown, no other lectures were given by him as he conducted the private classes during the time of the convocation. Our work was prepared by Rev. A. W. Witt as his thesis for ordination, and the all-seeing eye is by the same writer. The lecture, Origin of Symbolism and Eugenics, as taught by the Sacred College, or by Grace Kincaid Morey, a graduate of Oberlin College, Secretary of the Buffalo Rose Cross College, and Secretary of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated. The all-seeing eye is by Wayne E. Cake, who has given the subject consideration from the standpoint of a Freemason.
Eugenics, a lecture by Clara Witt, the acting secretary of the Rose Cross College of Kansas City, Missouri, a writer on eugenics and the sacredness of motherhood in the various Masonic magazines of the Middle West. Obedience, a lecture by M. Alice Reese, who was knighted as lady to August Rue before mentioned. The Christ Birth is a lecture delivered by Vera H. Barr, one of the teachers of the Kansas City College and assistant to Reverend A. W. Witt. The Power of Thought by Mrs. John W. Cook should have careful consideration by all students as we recognize that thought is the base of all action. These are but very few of the many lectures delivered during the sessions of the Sacred College and are given because they are fundamental and show the practical scope of the great work. The next convocation of the Sacred College is called for May 15, 1917, to be held in three sessions. Besides the regular lecture course, all the ancient degrees will be conferred, and in addition, the Temple of Philistian Degrees. Fraternally given, R. Swineburg and Clymer, Beverly Hall, November 25, 1916. Ladies and gentlemen, what you're going to hear tonight is going to be just the beginning of the revelation that those who believe in a master race, those who believe in the theory of white supremacy, those who believe that the Anglo-Aryan race are the true Israelites, will discover that they have been conned they have been scammed, and they are part of an attempt to destroy the United States of America and bring the world once again under the rule of Great Britain. So you had better pay attention. The doctrine, the doctrine of Christian identity, ladies and gentlemen, and of the British Israelite stems directly from the mysteries. It is one of the biggest scams that has ever been put across to the American people. And all of you who are taking part in it, all of you who are taking part in it, are, for all intents and purposes, calling Jesus Christ a liar. You are also helping in a great plan to destroy this great nation and bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government upon the face of this earth. And if you listen carefully and take notes, and if you go to the sources that we give you, you will discover this on your own. And if you study your own history, if you are of Aryan or Anglo descent, you will discover that there is no Hebrew root in your language. You will discover that your ancestors were primitive, fierce, terrible tribesmen who indulged in human sacrifice and worshipped the sun in temples such as Stonehenge. And if you're smart, if you're smart, you will join all those people in the world who want freedom, irregardless of their race, color, our creed. You will stop buying in to the Hegelian dialectic of divide and conquer, in which they separate us, feed us lies, and send us off to kill each other, while they place the chains about our ankles. Don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Sometimes people say to me, Rose, was the first time you ever heard this? You know why? You know why? Because I was born a woman. Well, if you think that that's not important or has no bearing upon what you're hearing, ladies and gentlemen, continue to listen. Take the doctrine out of your head that you don't want to hear the facts because you already know what you believe. Take the pen labeled Archie Bunker 
off of the front of your shirt and throw it in the trash can and pay attention and get smart and wise up. Stop being sheeple. The Order of the Holy Grail Few people are acquainted with the fact that the flower of manhood in France and England belonged to knighthoods founded ages ago. Their object being the recognition of and the homage due womanhood. These orders bear the names of Knights of the Garter in England, whose insignia is the Garter, and Knights of France, represented by the Fleur de Lis. Both these orders, ladies and gentlemen, were founded by men belonging to an older and nobler order, Knights of the Holy Grail, who took advantage of a trivial circumstance to establish these orders for the protection of womanhood. Though the knights were in search of the Holy Grail, their own soul, the Grail represents their own soul, they were ever ready to fight for their country, for womanhood, and the sacred mysteries. Other orders dating back many periods of time under different names and emblems entertained the same high-minded chivalric motifs. The motto of the Knights of the Garter, Onai soi qui mal yepins, translated, reads, Evil to him who evil thinks. This phrase fell from the lips of Edward III as he penned the garter, Guard her to his arm. To the initiated, this motto takes on a deeper meaning. In its most exalted purity, it was used by knights centuries before the Christian era. The garter is a feminine emblem, supposedly unseen unless by accident. A mishap to a noted countess caused the garter to become the insignia of one of the great orders in history. The greatest movements of an age often appear accidental. The fleur de lis is also an emblem of woman, and most of the symbols of the present and earlier ages are characteristic of eternal feminine. Centuries before Jesus walked the earth, members of sacred and honorable orders held the lingam sacred. In time, the lingam worship became degraded, not by the members of those orders, but by the people who came to understand something of the outer mysteries and degraded them. I want you to look up the meaning of the word lingam. L-I-N-G-U-M. The faith of both Christian and Catholic devotees is symbolized by emblems of sex. The Christian cross indicates the male and the heart, that of the opposite sex. Both cross and heart are creative or phallic emblems. There is nothing greater or higher in the universe of God than creative power. The power that can create can also recreate and regenerate. If we honor the Creator, why not the created creation? All the wisdom, philosophy underlying the knights of the different orders and the mythologies was based upon creative power. Probably the most beautiful and purest of mythological stories is that of Eros and Psyche, the story of the soul and its earth career. As all Sir Knights are expected to read mythology, it is not necessary to give details, but simply call attention to the esoteric meaning of this supposed myth. Aphrodite, or Venus, the fairest queen in the Greek heaven of the immortal gods, was subject to pride and jealousy and demanded homage because of her sex and beauty. Psyche, the soul, untainted by sin, was possessed of a beauty far more attractive and compelling than the mere physical beauty of Aphrodite. The inference is plain. They were rivals. In her innocence, Psyche worshipped Artemis, or purity, the deity of virgins. She had no desire to attend the festivals of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, because she knew not of love and beauty. This gave offense not only to the priestess, but to her parents as well. The parents called by us temptation, which is the beginning of all knowledge, induced her to appear before the goddess in all her purity and innocence. The worshippers fell down before her. Such obeisance to another beauty roused the anger and the jealousy of Aphrodite, who vowed vengeance on the radiant Psyche. Not having sinned, only listened to temptation, Psyche was really not subject to punishment. The soul that listens to the voice of the flesh is not necessarily punished, 
for that which follows. But because of passive resistance, it permits itself further temptation. Aphrodite, symbol of earth mother and procreation, resented the adulation bestowed upon innocence. If the worship of men turned from the priestess of love and passion to that which was chaste and immaculate, how could she people the earth and thereby obtain new worshippers? Brooding over this condition, she called her son Eros, or Cupid, the god of love, that beautiful emotion which enters into the heart of all created things, and bade him seek Psyche and arouse in her the desire of love and passion. She commanded him to keep himself inviolate, not taking into consideration the great law of the universe, which demands a just return for all things given or received. Eros, god of love, the law of love itself, retired to do his mother's bidding. Meanwhile, Psyche was lamenting the fate of her loneliness. The maidens about her were being taken in marriage, while she, the fairest, was left uncourted. Like the soul that listens to temptation, she had become an inhabitant of the realm of unrest and longing. No longer single-minded in her worship of Artemis, she was not yet possessed with the desire of love and passion, that state of feeling that would transform the worship of the gods into a longing to possess her. Eros was thus commissioned to bring this about. The temptations not resisted in the life of the soul bring about the unhappiness to which it is subjected. But at the same time, it is the fate of temptation to bequeath knowledge to the soul. Obedience to the tempter results in wrongdoing and sorrow, but it opens the way to wisdom and light. Before the edict of Aphrodite could be carried out, she decreed that Psyche should leave the abode of the gods. When the soul, in its untried purity, listens to temptation, it closes the doors of heaven against itself and must then prepare for its journey earthward. Death is its portion, or, as Psyche was told, she would espouse a monster. When the soul first comes within the influence of the earth life, it is not conscious of the restrictions of matter, nor the laws that confine it there. Psyche awoke to a new existence. To her surprise, she found herself surrounded by a realm of beauty with the promised monster nowhere in sight. But her happiness, her content, was of a passive nature. For though banished from the heaven of innocence, she was not awakened to the power and thraldom of passion. Not having actually sinned, she was not in possession of the knowledge of self. She heard the call of love, but saw no form. In answer to her question, Eros answered that it was love, her husband. The perplexed psyche could not be satisfied with mere assurances of love. The insistent call of the imprisoned soul for knowledge through all the senses, demanded recognition. She must see love. Love without passion does not satisfy mankind. It is a state of feeling undemonstrated. The urge in man must know, see, feel, and possess. Eros informs Psyche that because of an unalterable decree, she would never behold his face. Only in darkness could he come to her, only in secrecy could she know his embrace. To accept love as it is offered, to live surrounded by love, with thoughts unmixed with doubt or suspicion, would lift the soul to the heaven of happiness and immortality. Man, in his attempt to dissect and analyze, opens the way to grief and pain, worry and fear, doubt and misfortune. As darkness falls, or as the soul sinks deeper into the realm of matter, it feels the presence of unseen shapes about it. Fear contends with love, while passion awaits nearby. But Eros, love, makes himself heard through the veil of flesh, and whispers, Fear not, though the darkness of night surround thee, flesh covering the soul, I am with thee. My love shall sustain and protect thee. No matter where thou goest, to heaven or hell, thou art mine, my beloved, as I am thine, for I am love, the delight of the world, the giver of life. 
With love in the soul, there is nothing to fear. When the soul is supported by love, evil is powerless. Love not only gives life, not only bequeaths youth, health, and strength, but molds and perfects mankind. As Psyche received Eros, love, a thrill of joy, passed through her. She opened her arms to the tender form of the lovely youth and cried, Who art thou that takest pity on one doomed to be a sacrifice to the most terrible monster of the demons of hell? Eros answered, Fear not the monster of whom the oracle spoke. I am thy husband. I am he before whom both gods and fiends have reason to tremble. Love, supreme, is the husband of the soul. It may lead its spouse to the innermost shrine of heaven. Its shadow, lust, may lead to the lowest round of hell. So often mistaken for love, lust roams the earth, seducing, betraying, destroying womanhood. This unspeakable evil was the demon, the dragon, the monster, for which the knights of the grail were banded together to slay. All illnesses of women stem from the lust of men. Love supreme is the husband of the soul. Psyche, still fearful, replies, Why, if thou art death, that fearful ruler of the land of shades, whom even the mighty Zeus dreads, why comest thou in so pleasing a disguise? Thy voice is music, thy breath the perfume of roses, and the touch of thy lips enraptures me. What shall I call thee? The answer of Eros, Call me love is a light set in the midst of darkness. Love dissipates the blackness and unreality of death, disintegrates carnal, sensual desires. The love-encircled soul is able to resist destroying passions. It slays the dragon and its sacrifice to gain that which is real. Interpreted in another way, death, in the pleasing disguise of reward and release, kisses the lips of the weary, bids the soul fear not, and liberates it from the thraldom of earth. Love presides at birth, for through it the soul descends to earth, and its consequent experiences and lessons. Love presides at death, for through it the soul ascends to freedom, peace, and joy. O love and death, O death and love, how wondrous can ye are, the planet Venus thus at once is evening and morning star. O love and death, O death and love, life ended, life begun. The sun may rise, the sun may set, tis still the self-same sun. Life's problem here at last is solved. Step in, the door is ajar. O love and death, O death and love, how wondrous can ye are. Psyche and Eros lived happily together, even though the strangeness of life caused her momentary fear. The soul, surrounded by the darkness, the unreality of earth, seems bound to question the promises of love. Still, unless haunted by the phantoms of doubt and suspicion, the soul retains a general state of peace and happiness. But as time passed, the variety and newness of love waned, and doubt and suspicion became easy to entertain. Eros granted Psyche entire freedom in the selection of her guests, stipulating only that he be not questioned. The generosity and goodness of Eros roused the phantoms to a more spirited action. They urged her to insist upon knowing whom her husband really was. Surrounded by secrecy, how did she know that he was wholly hers? Could she depend upon him to supply her every need? With these questions and inferences, they opened the door to the most deadly of the phantom sisterhood, jealousy. The carnal mind, insisting upon proofs that can be seen and felt, refuses unseen verities. Mind immersed in materiality prefers a chaos of fact and objectivity to a cosmos of harmony and beauty. Eros, noting the perplexity, uncertainty, and unrest of Psyche, following the visits of the fiends disguised as friends, warned her. 
I beseech thee to be on thy guard, not only for the sake of our happiness, but because of the child immorality thou shalt bear me. If thy guests importune, torment, and worry thee to discover my identity, and thou succumb, I shall leave thee. It is beyond my power to oppose the will of the gods. Now, I mispronounce the name of the child. It's immortality, not immorality. Immortality. Psyche replied that with him near, happiness enveloped her. His touch filled her with aspiration and trust. His voice, as the wings of faith, lifted her to the realms of peace and security. But often she felt alone, and the group of sisters, though ugly, entertained her. It came about that inquisitiveness and fear were added to the brood that daily haunted the heart psyche. Surrounded by their influence, Eros was helpless. Though possessed of the power of the gods, love cannot dwell in the heart of suspicion. At last, unable to resist the combined influence of the demons, Psyche was persuaded to take her lamp, steal quietly into the chamber of Eros, and gaze upon the face of her beloved. As it lay revealed, a drop of oil caused him to awaken. At the instant of revelation, beholding a being of wondrous youth and beauty, she knew her fears, doubts, and suspicions to be groundless. At the moment of realization that she had possessed all that heart and life could desire because of a broken law, it was taken from her. The fiend of disobedience had completed her undoing. Psyche, Psyche, thou hast betrayed me. Now must I leave thee. Alone shalt thou suffer from the intrigues of thine enemies. Eros and Psyche parted. Love and soul were divided. In other words, soul, because of questionings, unbeliefs, doubts, unrest, severed itself from the heaven of faith, peace, and happiness. This is the story and the reason of the pilgrimage of the soul on the earth plane. How often is this story repeated in the homes of thousands today? Faith, security, happiness, bartered for doubts, suspicions, and jealousies. Psyche, adrift, despairing, was bereft of all things but hope. Having discovered the destructive power of evil thought, she turned about to win back the love, the heaven she had forfeited. To human justice, it would seem that now Aphrodite, divine law, would relent having witnessed the undoing of Psyche, but not so. The pain and suffering and longing of Psyche could in no wise mitigate her punishment. Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. To have reinstated Psyche among the gods would presuppose a power greater than law, which could nullify or soften its own edicts. Law is not annulled when all is lost through obedience, disobedience. Law is not annulled when all is lost through disobedience. Through pain and travail does one gradually win back their lost estate. Now Psyche called upon all the gods to aid her in recovering love. Her prayers and supplications failed to reach that high heaven, for a broken law becomes an impenetrable wall between an entreaty and its fulfillment. Hera, wife of Zeus, queen of heaven, and knowing all things, that goddess who dwelt near earth and presided over married life, pitied Psyche, saying, Would that I could present thy petition unto Zeus, mighty ruler of all men. That cannot be, for the word of Aphrodite is powerful, and her decrees inviolable. Thou hast brought about this thy fate. Endure the trials that shall come upon thee. Believe thou shalt dwell again in heaven, and work out thine own salvation. Psyche, whose one desire was to recover the delight and happiness of the past, endured the trials. She accepted the punishments. She passed the tests imposed upon her. As the reality of the statement became apparent to her that, to the soul without love, all is empty and hopeless, she turned as to a friend to the god of death, that monster 
whom she had most dreaded, and begged him to take her to the realm of Hades. The performance of that journey was the extreme penance for disobedience. And in the willingness to suffer death, in the willingness to be purged of all sin, she brought about her release, for she had paid the uttermost farthing. Now hearing of the voluntary journey of Psyche that she might regain love, Eros flew to her assistance, liberating her from the Stygian slumber, awakening her to life and love and youth. Ah, Psyche, thou most perished to atone for thy fault. Knowest thou not that only the gods can pass and repass the river Styx? To them it is a fountain of youth, but if mortals drink of it, it binds them to the wheel of birth and death. The gods recognize thy expiation and bid thee drink of this cup of immortality. Now had Psyche reproached Eros for unha her unhappiness, had she refused to place the cause of her sin and suffering upon herself, had she given up the search for lost love, the usual fate of mankind would have been hers. Unhappiness, poverty, worry, sickness, stagnation, death are the result of ceasing to search, to struggle, to conquer. The soul forfeits love and immortality through disobedience. It achieves love and immortality through faith and trust and loyalty. Death is the problem of life, but love is its solution. The search of the incarnate soul for immortality through the instrumentality of love is typified in the search of knights for the golden fleece or the holy grail. Bet you wondered where I was going. The legend of Eros and Psyche may be interpreted as the soul in search of love and immortality, enduring anguish and suffering caused by the sins of fear, doubt, suspicion, and disobedience. Other legends, as unfolded in this series, will outline and reveal those inner meanings and the significations of which are of importance to the students of knighthood and chivalry, this branch of the Illuminati, which originates in the Anglo-Aryan race. In the myths, ladies and gentlemen, surrounding King Arthur and the Round Table, and of those knights of the Holy Grail who were the forerunners of the Order of the Garter and other knighthoods, and in particular of the group known as the Round Table, one particularly is worthy of interpretation, demonstrating as it does the use and abuse of power. And in the second hour tonight, we will tell you the story of Merlin. The story, ladies and gentlemen, of Merlin. And we will continue with our revelation of where the doctrine of Christian identity, British Israelites, the master race, the people who want to rule everybody else, for in all of the lodges there is a prime, prime rule. The Anglo-Aryan race is supreme, and you will find no one of color in the lodge. Ladies and gentlemen, this scenario has been played out throughout the history of man. It has never changed. There's always someone who believes that they are the master race, that they are the only ones fit to rule, and they intend to enslave everyone else, even of their own race, for their motto is If you are not one of us, you are nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, in the material passed out by James Bobo Grites, Grits here, we call him Bobo Grits, Lieutenant Colonel James Bo Grites, in his spike training advertisement literature and in his spike video, you will see that Spike is spelled, and I left it up to many of you to learn what it is on your own. Some of you did, most of you did not. S. P. Penis of Osiris. K. E. S. P. Obelisk. K. E. 
S P Phalus K E S P Stupid Sheeple K E You had better wake up out there and you had better do it really quick. I'll be back, folks, nine PM Pacific, ten Mountain, eleven Central, and midnight Eastern Standard Time. Don't miss it, and if you do, tape it, and if you can't tape it, order the tapes from us. Good night, and God bless you all. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And we'll get it together sooner or later here, folks. Well, we were supposed to have a metal report from uh, Gene Miller, but he hasn't called, so we're going to go right into the program, and uh, I guess he'll have to do it on this hour tomorrow night. Right off the bat, I want to read a letter here from uh, a listener named John, who sent the reply from the office of Arlen Specter, United States Senator for Pennsylvania. Dear Mr. John, thank you for contacting my office regarding your request for Public Law 87-297. In an effort to be as helpful as possible, I have contacted the Senate document room who informs me that Public Law 87-297 is currently out of stock with no authority to reprint. Again, thank you for contacting me. Please let me know. If I can be of further assistance on this or any other matter of concern, sincerely, Arlen Specter. And uh, John encloses a little note at the bottom. Dear Bill, this is the reply I received from the Specter staff to my request for Public Law 87-297 and State Department Paper Number 7277. I called Washington and told them that 87-297 can be found on page 652 of Volume 9 of Title 22, United States Code 1988 Edition. I thank you for providing this information. I went on to inform the Spectre staff that as a citizen I am entitled to be allowed to learn the law and requested that they make a photocopy of the page specified and to send that photocopy of 87-297 to my location. I have received a copy of the booklet State Department paper number 7277 from the John Birch Society. It is exactly what you said it was, a written plan to disarm America. You've my permission to quote from these letters. God bless you, John. So, folks, don't let them get away with it. You see, since we ran the treason series, they have been telling you that the public laws are out of print and no longer available, and that is a blatant lie. Not only are they in print and available to all senators and congressmen in Washington, D.C., the Justice Department, the President of the United States, the Library of Congress, and every library in this country. So don't let these scumbag, creepo, treasonous traitors get away with it. Call them on it, just like John did, and make sure that you force their hand every single time. Otherwise, they will ride right over you. In the earlier hour of the hour of the time, we began a new series on the Rose Cross College, and I quoted verbatim from a book entitled The Rose Cross College, edited by R. Swineburn Clymer, copyrighted 1917. A resume of the teachings and proceedings of the Rose Cross College during its session held in the month of October 1916 on the 400th anniversary of the founding of the order. The Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi, its instructions in the official degree, Priests of Melchizedek, the Knights of Chivalry, and Order of the Holy Grail. So, folks, if you missed that hour, make sure that you order the tape. For non-CAGI members, tapes are $8 postpaid. For CAGI members, they're $6 postpaid. You may order tapes by sending your money to William Cooper, P.O. Box 1420, SHOLO, spelled S-H-O-W-L-O-W, Arizona, 85901. That's P.O. Box 1420, SHOLO, Arizona, 85901. In the beginning of this book, it described the initiation <laughs> in the Grove of Osiris, and uh, many other things, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, you need to know. The ancient degrees of Osiris were conferred upon the delegates 
during that period of time in 1916. And, you know, I put out some hints for you people to be examining the Greitz spike training tape, that there was some symbolism there. Some of you did. Most of you, as usual, stayed on your butts and didn't do anything. Many of you have been sucked in by Mr. Trojan Horse himself, Lieutenant Colonel James Bobo Gritz. If you look real closely at his spike training literature and his spike training video, you will see that spike is spelled S-P-O-B-L-I-S-T-K-E. S-P-O-B-L-I-S-T-K-E. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, S-P, Penis of Osiris, K-E. He's playing you for a fool. And again, just like all the others, he is laughing at you. A day and a half spike training. Uh-huh. And he teaches you how to fight with a double-edged blade and tells you that you are now a member of Delta Force. Let me read to you from a dictionary of Freemasonry exactly what Delta means. And during a later program, ladies and gentlemen, we will play a tape, a briefing tape, for high-ranking officers in the United States Army on the 1st Earth Battalion, which describes, again, what Task Force Delta is really all about. Delta, the name of the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. In form, it is a triangle and was considered by the ancient Egyptians a symbol of fire, and also of God in the Scottish and French systems, and also that of the Knights Templar. The triangle, or Delta, is a symbol of the unspeakable name. And we go back a little further, ladies and gentlemen. I-N-R-I. Jesus, Nazarenus Rex, Udiorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the inscription which was placed upon the cross of the Savior. In the Philosophical Lodge, they represent fire, salt, sulfur, and mercury. In the system of the Rosicrucians, they had a similar use. Igni natura renovatur integra, meaning literally, by fire, nature is perfectly renewed. This idea is also found in the degree of night. The depths of the eagle are of the sun. Remember, fire is connected to delta. Remember that they burn their enemies to purify the soul so that the enemies will not come back after them. Don't go away. You, you, my dear sheeple, have an awful lot to learn. Governments are controlled and operated by a few, not with the thought of producing the most good for the greatest number of people, but to obtain power and riches for the few at the expense of the many. The few are waiting in streams of gold while the many are growing under hard burdens. In the myths surrounding King Arthur and the Round Table and those knights of the Holy Grail who were the forerunners of the Order of the Garter and other knighthoods, one particularly is worthy of interpretation, demonstrating as it does the use and abuse of power. The story of Merlin is soon told. Merlin was the son of no mortal father, but of an incubus, one of a class of beings not absolutely wicked, but far from good, who inhabited regions of the air. Merlin's mother was a virtuous young woman, who on the birth of her son entrusted him to a priest who hurried him to the baptismal font. And so saved him from sharing the lot of his father, though he retained many marks of his unearthly origin. At this time, Vortigern reigned in Britain. He was a usurper who had caused the death of his sovereign, Moines, and driven the two brothers of the late king, whose names were Uther and Pendragon, into banishment. Vortigern, who lived in constant fear of the return of the rightful heirs of the kingdom, began to erect a strong tower for defense. The edifice, when brought by the workmen to a certain height, three times fell to the ground without any apparent cause. The king consulted his astrologers on this wonderful event and learned from them that it would be necessary to bathe the cornerstone of the foundation with the blood of a child born without a mortal father. In search of such an infant, Vortigern sent his messengers all over the kingdom, and they by accident discovered Merlin, whose lineage seemed to point him out as the individual wanted. 
They took him to the king. But Merlin, young as he was, explained to the king the absurdity of attempting to rescue the fabric by such means. For he told him the true cause of the instability of the tower was its being placed over the den of two immense dragons whose combats shook the earth above them. The king ordered his workmen to dig beneath the tower, and when they had done so they discovered two enormous serpents, the one white as milk, the other red as fire. The multitude looked on with amazement till the serpents, slowly rising from their den and expanding their enormous folds, began the combat. When everyone fled in terror, except Merlin, who stood by, clapping his hands and cheering on the conflict, the red dragon was slain, and the white one, gliding through a cleft in the rock, disappeared. These animals typified, as Merlin afterwards explained, the invasion of Uther and Pendragon, the rightful princes, who soon after landed with a great army. Vortigern was defeated, and afterwards burned alive in the castle he had taken such pains to construct. On the death of Vortigern, Pendragon ascended the throne. Merlin became his chief advisor, and often assisted the king by his magical arts. Merlin, who knew the range of all their arts, had built the king his havens, ships, and halls. Vivienne. Merlin continued to be a favorite counselor through the reigns of Pendragon, Uther, and Arthur, and at last disappeared from view and was no more found among men through the treachery of his mistress, Vivienne the fairy, which happened in this wise. Merlin, having become enamored of the fair Vivienne, the Lady of the Lake, was weak enough to impart to her various important secrets of his art, being impelled by fatal destiny, of which he was at the same time fully aware. The Lady, however, was not content with his devotion, unbounded as it seems to have been, but cast about. The romance tells us how she might detain him forevermore and one day addressed him in these terms. Sir, I would that we should make a fair place and a suitable, so contrived by art and by cunning, that it might never be undone, and that you and I should be there in joy and solace. My lady, said Merlin, I will do all this. Sir, said she, I would not have you do it, but you shall teach me, and I will do it, and then it will be more to my mind. I grant you this, said Merlin. Then he began to devise, and the damsel put it all in writing, and when he had devised the whole, then had the damsel full great joy, and showed him greater semblance of love than she had ever before made, and they sojourned together a long, long while. At length it fell out that as they were going one day hand in hand through the forest of Brasiliand, they found a bush of white thorn which was laden with flowers, and they seated themselves under the shade of this white thorn upon the green grass, and Merlin laid his head upon the damsel's lap and fell asleep. Then the damsel rose and made a ring with her wimple round the bush and round Merlin, and began her enchantments such as he himself had taught her. And nine times she made the ring, and nine times she made the enchantment, and then she went and sat down by him, and placed his head again upon her lap. And when he awoke and looked around him, it seemed to him that he was enclosed in the strongest tower in the world, and laid upon a fair bed. Then said he to the dame, My lady, you have deceived me, unless you abide with me, for no one hath power to unmake this tower but you alone. She then promised she would be often there, and in this she held her covenant with him. And Merlin never went out of that tower, where his mistress Vivienne had enclosed him, but she entered and went out again when she listed. After this event, Merlin was never more known to hold converse with any mortal but Vivienne, except on one and only one occasion. Arthur, having for some time missed him from his court, sent several of his knights in search of him, and among the number, Sir Gwain, who met with a very unpleasant adventure while engaged in this quest, happening to pass a damsel on his road and neglecting to salute her, as all true knights should, she revenged herself for his incivility by transforming him into a hideous dwarf. He was bewailing aloud his evil fortune, 
As he went through the forest of Brasiliad, when suddenly he heard the voice of one groaning on his right hand, and looking that way, he could see nothing save a kind of smoke which seemed like air, and through which he could not pass. Merlin then addressed him from out of the smoke, and told him by what misadventure he was imprisoned there. Ah, sir, he added, you will never see me more, and that grieves me, but I cannot remedy it. I shall never more speak to you, nor to any other person, save only my mistress. But do thou hasten to King Arthur, and charge him for me to undertake without delay the quest of the sacred grail. The knight is already born, and has received a knighthood at his hands, who is destined to accomplish the quest. And after this, he comforted Gawain under his transformation, assuring him that he should speedily be disenchanted. And he predicted to him that he should find the king at Carduel in Wales on his return, and that all the other knights who had been on like quest would arrive there the same day as himself. And all this came to pass, as Merlin had said. Now the interpretation of this story, ladies and gentlemen, was something like this. To those questioning the statement that men were ever born half-human, as it were, or that Merlin could be the son of an earth maiden and an inhabitant of another sphere, are referred to the Bible. You see, it says, quote, Sons of the gods, seeing that the daughters of men were fair, had intercourse with them, and children were born, unquote. Throughout the scriptures, incubi, beings of the air, are called gods. The soul, before it became submerged in matter, dwelt in a negative sphere, according to the mysteries, knowing neither good nor evil, never having had experience. The infinite allowed the souls to incarnate in flesh, that they might eat of the tree of life and learn of life and death, good and evil. Now remember, this is the philosophy of the mysteries. This is no way what I believe. The incubi, possessing not the four elements fire, air, earth, and water, cannot know immortality, but their children, through the instrumentality of earth mothers, pass under the law of humans, and having lived upon the earth may receive the blessing of immortality. Now remember the definition of the inscription placed upon the cross above Christ's, Christ's head, the definition that I read to you from the Dictionary of Freemasonry. To secure this great boon, the mother of Merlin summoned the priest, that through the power of priestly invocation he might be bound to earth and earth conditions. It was believed in those early days, and there is much truth back of the assertion, that the influence of the church being invoked was powerful enough to counteract or at least neutralize any inherited evil characteristics. It proved impossible to erase all traces of Merlin's non-earthly parentage, for he possessed an innate knowledge of the mysteries and also the power to use magic. Vortigern, the usurper who succeeded to the throne through murder, was in league with the black magicians. He consulted astrologers who prescribed a blood sacrifice to prevent further disaster. Now, the early knighthoods consisted of two classes of men those allied with the black magicians who resorted to blood sacrifice and other fiendish practices to appease the gods, and those who, seeking the Holy Grail, defended their religion, country, and womanhood. The building of the tower and its demolition may be interpreted in symbolic language as man, in whom the higher and lower principles are constantly in a struggle for supremacy. Red signifies evil, while good is always represented by white. That was carried over in the old westerns, where the good guy always wore the white hat, and the bad guy always wore the black. Merlin, a knight by birth, understanding both black and white magic, advised Vortigern to free the two demons and allow them to battle to the death. Remember, these are the demons within man. The fight ended in the vanquishment of the red dragon, or evil, symbolic of the final event in every struggle between good and evil forces. This was the beginning of the downfall of Vortigern. Having depended upon evil for support, he was left helpless at the death of his ally. With the return of Uther and Pendragon and their armies, Vortigern was defeated and burned alive in his castle. 
Now, translated with the aid of symbolism, the defeat would read as follows, ladies and gentlemen. Every life, devoted and upheld by evil forces, sooner or later faces destruction. When his race is run, the powers of good forsake him, and evil continues the work of annihilation. Every human being is given the power of choosing whom he will serve. If he surrenders to evil, he, not God, pronounces his doom. But thou avengest what men commit against themselves, seeing when they sin against thee, they do wickedly against their own souls, and iniquity gives itself the lie by corrupting and perverting their nature. And, of course, the end is darkness, death, destruction. Merlin, because of magical arts, was chief advisor to the new king. White magic in the knightly brotherhoods was a religion scientifically based on demonstrable laws manifested through invocations. Though strong, there was one weak spot in the armor of Merlin. The beauty and seductiveness of a woman brought him to desolation. Through the weakness of his love nature, he permitted himself to break the greatest of all oaths, that oath of secrecy taken by all knights to protect the secrets of the order even to the death. The result, ladies and gentlemen, was automatic. The law is inexorable. Those who betray shall be betrayed. In trusting to the love and loyalty of the woman whose secrets committed to his keeping, he made her the executor of the decree of his oath. In taking the oath of knighthood, man is supposed to be free from all slavery. Whether sex or habit, before presenting himself for membership. Otherwise, he but places himself in a position of pearl and jeopardizes his soul. The legends of Merlin and Samson are alike in outline and meaning. Both became slaves of women, casting aside honor, truth, and loyalty. The foundation stones of the power of the knight of the order are the master of the mysteries. The pitiful picture of Merlin in his last speech to any man, is significant. You see, imprisoned in the tower of his disloyalty, he yet remembers the quest of knighthood, and he sends word to King Arthur, charging him to seek the Holy Grail, and that the knight destined to find it has already been born. The legends of Eros and Psyche, which we explored in the earlier episode of The Hour of the Time, and this legend of Merlin illustrate the most important lessons in the career of a knight. In the first, the effects of doubt, fear, and disobedience are brought to mind. The second charges him to conserve his strength and forces, to preserve an independence of all slavish habits, to protect and defend his oath, to hold in remembrance the sacredness of the mission of the search for the Holy Grail. And remember, in the earlier hour, ladies and gentlemen, we learned that to the mysteries, the Holy Grail represents the soul. The soul. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. And they don't even believe that most people have a soul until they prepare the body to receive it. <laughs> so, you are learning. You are learning much faster than you ever could on your own. Skipping ahead, in this respect, the pyramid is a perfect symbol of man when he has reached the state called illumination of soul. Our soul consciousness, or in other words, has found the center or located the all-seeing eye. Skipping ahead again, may we look to masonry in completing the great work, or will it continue to be purely materialistic? Let this be the mission of masonry to perfect the work for which its outer symbology stands. Shall it be so? This is an admission that they are purely materialistic at this point and have been throughout their history. While this is truly a Masonic work, the work for which the Mason has made a good foundation when he has completed his three degrees, yet it is also a work for every man, and especially a work for those who have taken up, or who have opportunity and inclination to take up, the special training offered freely today, 
by the representatives of the ancient schools through the Illuminati, Sons of Osiris, Magi, and other fraternities. Skipping ahead again, several pages. The fire philosophy is the basis of all religious mysteries and all the secret philosophies of the universe. It is also the underlying principle on which all secret occult brotherhoods are founded. It was taught in the ancient mysteries, and although the knowledge of it has long been lost to the world, it has always been preserved in the occult fraternities. The aim of all true initiation, no matter what the name of the fraternity may be, is to know the nature of the secret fire that regenerates the world and which renders him who comes into its possession immortal. The mystic has always held that masonry was one of the bases upon which religion was founded, that the mysteries of masonry, when fully understood, are the same as the ancient mysteries, and therefore the mysteries of religion itself. The way to godhood, be thou a man, and thou mayest be a god. Be a man, and thou mayest be a god. This is the divine command of the new age. The new commandment teaches how to live that manhood shall be the first great stage of growth and that godhood may follow manhood. Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites is a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. He is a member of the Mormon Church and has been initiated in the temple ceremony in which it is revealed to him that Lucifer is the god that he follows, that Christ had his chance on earth and failed and that it is Lucifer's turn. This can be found and referenced and confirmed fully in a book entitled The God Makers and in the videotape by the same name. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move to another book entitled the Teachings of the Masters, the Wisdom of the Ages, an Exposition of the Ever-Active and Constantly Operating Spiritual Laws, applicable not only to the regeneration of man, changing mortality into immortality, transmuting the Son of Man into a Son of God, but equally potent in helping man to achieve success and economic independence, health, strength of body, and the peace of mind and heart called heaven. Below that is the symbol of a Christian cross, upon which is the caducus, two serpents entwined about the winged staff. Enlarged and completely revised, together with many additions by Rev. Dr. R. Swainburne Clymer, Director General, Church of Illumination, Supreme Grand Master of the International Confederation of Initiates, Supreme Grand Master of the Merged Occult Fraternities Comprising the Priesthood of Ith, the Rosicrucian Order, the Secret Schools, the Hermetic Brotherhood, Fraternitas Rosicrucius, Temple of the Rosy Cross, the Order of the Magi, Sons of Isis and Osiris, Illuminati Americani, which translated means the American Illuminati. Published by the Philosophical Publishing Company, Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, copyright 1952 by Beverly Hall Corporation, all rights reserved. Prologue. Early in the year 1916, instructions were received from the Count M. de Saint Vincent, Supreme Hierarch of the Fraternitas Rosicrucius, to make preparations for a sacred convocation on the 68th anniversary of the establishment of the Supreme Grand Dome of the Fraternitas and Associate Organizations as established in America by Dr. Paschal Beverly Randolph. At this convocation, which was to convene on June 1, 1916, the neophyte body was to be informed of a crisis that would be the beginning of the enslavement of the people of America in a manner so insidious that they would not be aware of it. America was to become engaged in a war that would be only the beginning of greater wars. It was prophesied that an effort would be made to destroy the Christian religion so secretly and silently that only the alert and elect would be aware of this activity. This effort is in full bloom today and is making atheists out of millions, even before their churches are destroyed, the reverse of what has happened and is happening in other countries. 
At this convocation, we were instructed to hold daily lectures on subjects vitally important to all, in fact, to all the world, and more especially so to neophytes of the August fraternity. These instructions were to be after the manner of Plato and the round table of King Arthur. In addition, we were to prepare for the exemplification of the entire ritual of the fraternity, sons of Osiris, up to and including the royal purple degree, the ultimate of ancient ritualistic initiation symbolizing the neophyte's travels and efforts beginning with the first step and including the final step, which is the second or spiritual birth. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are now beginning to learn some things that you thought was absolutely impossible, and I've told you on many episodes of the Hour of the Time that none of this is hidden. Anyone can find it. Anyone, that is, except sheeple who are too lazy to get up and look. Those who will, may. I am a messenger. Do not doubt that ever. And the message that I am bringing you is clear. It is concise, and there can be no mistake in its interpretation. You must wake up now or be enslaved. The war has begun many years ago. The war was declared by our enemies upon us. We are absolutely within our rights to restore our nation using any method or any manner that is required in so doing. You had better listen. Some years ago, our Swinburne climber, following his graduation as a physician and author of many books, among them The Mysticism of Masonry, The Rosicrucians, Their Teachings, The Mysteries of Osiris, a book for members only, The Philosophy of Fire, Soul Science and Immortality, and more than 30 other works, bought a mountainous tract of land, and on this was built Beverly Hall, an assembly hall, press room, chemical laboratories, which surrounded by orchards, vineyards, and rose gardens, set amongst terrace lawns, presents a splendid combination of the beautiful and practical. And upon the front lawns, there are perfect duplicates of the three pyramids of Giza. And to this was added the mystic, or arcane, for folks in a secluded and wooded tract of 50 acres of this land. An artificial lake was built from a mountain stream. A throne room erected for the explication of the royal third degree of Osiris and the seal of Solomon built under the protection of a mighty oak. The temple of the sun, an exact duplicate of that in the outer courtyard of the Vatican, an exact duplicate of the separated four sections of that which can be found in Dini Plaza. The obelisk, the phallus of Osiris, which can be found in New York, in London, in the Vatican, and in Dili Plaza. The Grove of Osiris, represented in Dili Plaza by Elm Street. Wake up. During the period of the convocation, the teachers and delegates delivered many lectures on the subjects of eugenics, scientific motherhood, Code of Ethics, Spiritual Christianity, and that's a laugh when you discover what it is. Initiation, reincarnation, soul development, the four square man, mystic significance of the seal of the United States and other important subjects all interpreted in their arcane significance by the masters of the sea, spelled S-E-E. -E. Moses was well versed in all the mysteries of Egypt while Joseph took the Nazarene to Egypt where he was educated. The Nazarene, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus Christ. This is what they claim. They claim that no ceremony of the greater mysteries was ever permitted unless the circle or seal of Solomon, also known as the sacred seal of equilibrium, had been previously prepared. 
Since the fall of Egypt and the Temple of Solomon, the seal has received little or no attention except by a limited few students and neophytes of ancient religion and the mysteries. During the first week in June, in the groves so carefully prepared for the dramatization of the ancient initiation into the mysteries of Osiris, the ritual in its entirety was reenacted by those present. The seal of Solomon, which had been especially built for the purpose, was dedicated on June 11, 1916, in the presence of the members and delegates of the Rosy Cross, some of whom were natives of Germany, England, and White Russia. This was in accordance with and after the manner of the system practiced by the ancient initiate priests of Egypt and the altar in the Temple of Solomon. On the night of June 13th, the first section of the delegation, including those of the order taking part in the initiation, assembled in the Grove of Osiris under the majestic oak, the whole illuminated from a central powerhouse prepared for the initiation ceremonies of the ancient mysteries of Egypt in three degrees and six scenes. Three degrees and six scenes, represented by the number 18, are six, six, six. It is the number of a man. That man is the illumined man who has passed the travails of the three degrees in six acts. It is the man. It is the Antichrist. It is the rulers of the new world order. I'm going to skip ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, for we must go to that portion that is relevant to what you need to learn tonight. And we will continue. If we do not finish tonight, and I guarantee you we will not, we will finish sometime in the future, but we will continue on consecutive nights with this until we do. Few Americans of the present day have the slightest idea of how fortunate they are and that they are living in the greatest, freest nation that ever existed despite its many shortcomings. Now remember, I'm reading this from the book Teachings of the Masters. Neither are they aware that America, the land overshadowed with wings, is at the crossroads, one leading to greater freedom, both individual and universal, and the other to the most abject and degrading serfdom, as a result of failing to accept the full responsibility for the management of their personal and governmental affairs, so that these may harmonize with the ancient prophecies. Remember, I warned you, and I told you that is exactly what is happening. This was the great experiment. If you had proven worthy, this could have been the New World Order, sheeple. A still lesser number are aware that the history of America from its very beginning to the end of its days, whether for good or ill, is told in its seal, exactly as I have told you on past programs. While only the very few know that their own destiny is irrevocably interwoven with the destiny of America, America the last trying chamber for human souls, and that when this trial is over, either heaven or hell will reign supreme. Few care, because they selfishly think only of themselves, they forget the future welfare of their sons and daughters. And of course, we saw that when you all patted your sons and daughters on the butt and sent them off to die in a war in the desert in the Middle East, all the while claiming that they were going off to fight for their country, you fools. Desert scam. An old saying has it that familiarity breeds contempt. As a corollary to this, there should be another maxim. We are blind to that which we see so frequently. Most Americans... Even though the spirit of America dwells within them, are actually only dimly aware that the great seal of the first actually free country in the world shows an eagle, a constellation of stars, an olive branch, and a set of thirteen arrows. This is the seal we all know. 
Symbolically, the eagle overshadows the land by its protective wings, but only as long as man proves worthy of such overshadowing or protection. Man has the power to destroy the eagle that overshadows or protects him. The constellation of stars indicates that the founders of America accepted the absolute law that has governed the drama of heaven since the beginning of the world and must be accepted and obeyed in this new world. The olive branch is the symbol of peace and friendship held out to all who are willing to forget and completely root out from their consciousness the degeneration of old worlds and elect to live in the spirit of the new world or the new age. The thirteen arrows are symbolic of the wars which are part of the drama in the heavens and the wars that must be waged against all evils as well as all evil individuals if man's freedom is to be maintained. It is each and every citizen's personal responsibility to eternally fight against these individual and universal evils. There is the prophetic reverse side of the seal, uncut, because the time is not ready for the prophetic fulfillment which was known to few others than the philosophic initiates prior to its profane and premature use on the American $1 certificate. Several attempts have been made to cut this reverse side of the seal, but in each instance an invisible hand or force restrained the effort. At the time of the Chicago World's Fair, this reverse side was ordered cut together with a familiar obverse side as an object of display, but those in charge, wholly ignorant of its meaning, and also ignorant of the spirit of true America, questioned with a peculiar design. Why are we given this inartistic design? And this white stone, symbolic of the nation's destiny, as of the nation's true souls, was once again rejected. The soul of America is betrayed and is in travail. Foreign inimical hordes are given almost unrestrained access into the country without a thought as to whether or not they are ready to throw off the gross, degrading, destructive evils of the old world and invest themselves with the spirit of the new with a wholehearted willingness to obey America's fundamental laws. Nor is that all. They are given high places, usurping the rights and privileges of those more capable born Americans wholly imbued with the true American spirit. If you have ears and you can hear, and eyes and you can see, you will begin to understand what the author is saying within a few more paragraphs, and you will be shocked. This helps bring about the gradual degradation of all that is truly American, so much so that the eagle whose wings overshadow America is gradually folding her wings and withdrawing heaven's protection. The time has come when a full knowledge of the twofold seal and all it stands for shall be made known to the people, so they may accept and be protected or saved, or ignore and be damned, and swept into the sea of oblivion, as have been other nations before America, because they permitted foreign invasion and the adoption of destructive ideas to take the place of the constructive ideas which had made them great. America must awaken. She must be awakened by one means or another. Her own safety and the welfare of her own people must be protected against all foreign spawned ideologies born as the result of selfishness and defiance of God himself. And all his laws, laws which throughout the eons have preserved the world and the drama of heaven, through the peoples of nations unnumbered have perished as a result of their own disobedience and degradation. America, its people, individually and collectively, must become valiant and now henceforth stand before the world as exemplars. They must be leaders and promulgators of a new and equitable system of ethics, religious inculcations based on sound material and spiritual truths, and a citizenship that is honorable and noble, a justice and generosity to other nations that is unquestioned, but without the weakness of cowardly compromise, lacking all honor and fairness to her own people, and emphasize the possibility of brotherhood based on individual, personal freedom, and obedience to laws that apply universally. Now to digress, but vital to our thesis, Late in the afternoon of July 14, 1776, the New Continental Congress resolved that Dr. Franklin, 
Mr. J. Adams and Mr. Jefferson be a committee to prepare a device for a seal of the United States of America, all of these men, members of the mystery religion. The committee was identical with the one that had drawn up the Declaration of Independence, except for the omission of Robert Livingston and Roger Sherman. The Declaration itself had been signed about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and Congress desired to at once complete the evidence of the independence of the United States and of its people by formally adopting an official sign of sovereignty and national coat of arms. The coat of arms of England, the mother country, illustrated the union of Judah's lion with the unicorn of lost Israel. In accordance with the science governing heraldry, the young republic, born out of the throes of religious persecution, more than as a result of the sufferings of unjust taxation, was through, finished, with thrones and crowns. It was ready to blaze a new path under the shadow of the eagle's wings to the forest of the new world in the cause of liberty, which should express her descent from the spirit of the Christian peoples of all nations and open a door for all who sought help and shelter upon her shores. She rejected, she rejected British Israelism. She rejected the Lion of Judah. In the early colonial days, a knowledge of heraldry was considered an important part of education, just as throughout the ages it was necessary to have an understanding of symbolism, which indicated a knowledge of the governing law of the universe and the drama of the ages and their effect on humanity, individuality, and collectively. It was through William Barton, son of the rector of St. James Episcopal Church of Philadelphia, learned in heraldry, and Baron Prestwich of England, that the designs expressive of America's destiny were developed and drawn. First, you must understand that the lion represents the tribe of Judah. Judah was not a part of the state of Israel. That is a historical fact, ladies and gentlemen. Israel was separate from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Our forefathers knew this. The British apparently do not, and neither apparently do identity Christians. The two sides of America's seal express in heraldry the countless ages of the evolution of man. This evolution had its beginnings even before the time of the so-called or misinterpreted fall of man. The seal symbolizes man's progress in Egypt, Eagle Land, America's actual fatherland, where for a time a wondrous race incarnated to build an unexplainable and inconceivable monument as a symbol of and memorial to the knowledge imparted to her by the more ancient Atlantis, and this is confirmation of everything that I've been telling you about the beliefs of the mystery religion. The ancient memorial or altar, the Great Pyramid, unites in a blaze of glory with the later building of King Solomon's Temple as a prophecy of the coming of a master teacher, the Nazarene. He should be trained, taught, and initiated in the eagle land and bring into manifestation the human spiritual temple, perfecting the Son of Man into the Son of God as a fulfillment of ancient prophecy that in this same Egypt there should remain an altar where light should shine in the land of darkness. Another prophecy by Isaiah and symbolism connected the land of Egypt, or Eagle Land, with the land overshadowed by the wings of the Eagle America. Where there is an altar, Statue of Liberty, upon which is burning the light of freedom for all who accept the law, and are worthy of their freedom. This great pyramid, an altar at the center of the earth, symbolic of man's spiritual, our soul center, recognized as a temple of the highest initiation, was emblematic of the perfect man, foursquare of body, mind, spirit, and soul. Where have you heard? As I raised my hand to the square, or as I raised my arm to the square, This white copestone symbolizes the attainment of immortality or cosmic consciousness, and you hear that throughout the New Age movement. 
It represents the measure of the earth as well as that of the universe, as also the evolution of physical man through those countless ages of reincarnation, now drawing to a restricted time, a time in which man will revert in his evolutionary path or will become God. The last Kumain song now comes, wrote Virgil, and prophesied that a race should arise which would be the offspring of all races except those who isolated themselves and bring about the end of the ages of iron or war, ushering in the golden age, an age of honor, personal responsibility, and obedience to the divine law. It was therefore fitting that the mottoes upon the reverse side of our seal, above and below the pyramid, should be taken from Virgil. And you accept us means prosperous in our daring, and novus ordo seclorum means a new world order. It is well to constantly keep in mind the term select, because it is only the obedient, hence the select, that may or can reap the benefit of the reacting law. What unadulterated bullshit. Good night, and God bless you all. You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And uh, right off the bat, folks, we've spoken to our supplier. And we are back in the food storage business. And this time, I hope you take advantage of it. Only, unfortunately, if you don't hurry, you're going to pay a lot more. And that's the truth. Remember, last summer, had all the flooding in the Midwest. Killed a lot of crops had widespread drought across the Midwest and all through the South. And if you've been noticing in the supermarket, food prices are going up steadily. They will continue to go up because there is becoming a shortage of certain supplies of food. Now, I'm not going to do it like we did last time. Last time, we invested a lot of money in flyers and circulars and all this stuff to let you guys know what was in these food storage packages. And uh, I guess altogether we spent close to $1,000. Not one person purchased any of it. We offered the same food that everyone else offers, stored the same way in enameled cans, nitrogen packed, just like everyone else offers, the same quality food, dehydrated, and uh, at a much, much lower price than you can get anywhere in this country. Bar none, ladies and gentlemen. It happens to be a fact. So what we're going to do is once a week we're going to offer something at a special price. If you want it, you've got to buy it. Your envelope has to be postmarked within that week. If it's not, we will send your money and your order back to you. It must be postmarked in the week that we offer it. Otherwise, you pay real t- retail price. We're not going to play around with you anymore. Uh, we... Uh, we did it for you. We invested a lot of money for you. Uh, we made it available for you. Nobody took advantage of it. The minute we stopped, everybody wants it back. So now we got it back. We're going to do it this way. We're going to tell you what's in the package, what we're offering, and what the price is. And if you want it, you must send your money and it must be postmarked within that week that we offer it. If it's not, you pay the retail price after that until we offer it again if we do. And as long as people take advantage of what we offer, we will continue to offer. The minute that people stop taking advantage of these special bargains on these uh, food storage packages, then we will stop offering it. Um, We're serious about this, folks. And all of you can sit on your butts out there all you want to. We are not going to eat it in our pocketbook because uh, you're vacillating or you don't understand what's going on or whatever your problem happens to be. It just hurts me that we spent that much money. Nobody bought any of this. The minute we stopped offering it, you all want to know why we stopped and you want to purchase these packages. Well, here they are. We're going to offer one item per week at a special price. It will be cheaper than you can get it anywhere else in the United States of America. And unless you got to, unless you go out and find suppliers that will sell uh, bits and pieces of this and you package it yourself, you're not going to find a cheaper price, folks. So tonight and through next Thursday, tonight through next Thursday, if your order is postmarked either today, tomorrow, or any day between now and next Thursday, and that includes next Thursday, folks, you can have this, what we're going to offer tonight, and it's what people need the most. So we're going to start out with this, give you an opportunity to pick it up real quick. We're going to offer 
one year food supply for a full family of four people. One year food supply for a full family of four people. Now that means that this will adequately furnish two people with two years food supply. There are 37 cases. The shipping weight is 1,078 pounds. The retail price is $2,768. That's the retail price. We will give it to all the listeners of this program starting tonight and through next Thursday for $2,268. That's $500 off. For CADU members, $2,000. That's $768 off. Now, if you can beat that deal, go buy it. If you can't, get off your butts, quit complaining, and order it now. You've got until next 30, Thursday to order it. Now, let me tell you what's in the package so you'll know. Uh, this is called the uh, family unit. It's one year supply for four adults or two years for two. Now, if you have children, this food will last longer. 36 cases of number 10 cans plus a sprouting unit, which makes a total of 37 cases. Shipping weight is 1,078 pounds. The volume is 35.2 cubic feet. The amount of water that you need to store to be able to reconstitute this food is 545 gallons, or if you can't store it, you need to be able to obtain that water when you need it over that period of time. Now remember, the 545 gallons of water are used to reconstitute the dehydrated food over a one-year supply for four adults or two-year for two adults. Now remember these adults, if you're feeding children, unless they're teenage boys, uh, you won't need as much. If they're teenage boys, then this might not last as long. <laughs> and you, those of you who have teenage boys, you know what I'm talking about. In the number 10 cans, you'll get two of fruit mix, two of applesauce, two of apple slices, two of raisins, two of banana slices, two of potato granules, two of corn, two of carrot dices, two of tomato powder, two of onions chopped, two of peas green garden, two of cabbage, two of bacon bits, uh, six of beef, four of chicken, two of uh, gelatin fruit flavor, two soup base, two peanut butter, two margarine product, two cheese blend, two of salt, 24 of uh, instant nonfat milk, 24 of regular nonfat milk, 12 of uh, pinto beans, 12 macaroni, uh, that's elbow macaroni, 12 uh, with rice. You'll get uh, 24 uh, wheat, hard red wheat. You'll get uh, 24 of uh, whole wheat flour, 24 cracked wheat cereal, uh, 12 of uh, uh, white sugar. You'll get uh, and two and a half cans, folks. You'll get two with uh, mung beans and Alaska peas, uh, two triticale, uh, two lentils, uh, one complete cookbook for cooking and reconstituting and cooking uh, dehydrated food, one sprouting tray, 80 lids for number 10 cans, and three lids for number two and a half cans. Recommended water storage, again, is 545 gallons. Contains 36 cases of number 10 cans, totaling 216 cans in a sprouting unit, plus uh, um, the number of two and a half, number two and a half cans that uh, I read off for you. Now, I'm going to tell you again, you can't get this deal anywhere else in the United States. If you can, buy it. If you can't, then buy it from us right now, between now and next Thursday. After next Thursday, that unit will not be offered. We'll offer something else. And we'll just go down the list until uh, we've offered uh, whatever suits you. But for those of you who have been looking for a year supply for a family of four, or two years for two, and remember these are adults, you cannot beat what I have just offered you. Remember, if you're not a CADGI member, regular listener to this program, that's a $500 discount off the retail price. Now, I can't do better for you. So don't give me the sheeple whining crap that I get all the time. If you want it, get it. If you don't, don't call up and whine. Don't uh, tell me that the, don't. I don't want to hear anything, okay? After our experience when we first offered this stuff and the money that we put out, I don't want to hear anything except if you want it, order it. Otherwise, just uh, shut up, okay? Uh, tonight we're going to get further into the expose of the root of racial tension 
in this country and elsewhere in the world, how they keep us uh, divided and conquered, and what it really stems from. And most of you who believe in this Aryan master race crap, and uh, most of you who are, call yourselves identity Christians, I don't care if you worship in that church. I don't care if you believe that. The only people I care about are people who are racists who want to kill other people who don't look like them or hurt other people who don't look like them or get rid of them or something. Those people I will oppose forever. Uh, I will uh, protect your right to worship at whatever altar uh, you wish to worship at as long as you wish to worship there forever. I don't care. That's your, your business, and it's your right in this country. We believe in that right. That's the only way that it can be. Otherwise, you can have a state that has a state church and uh, we're all going to have to conform to that. That's exactly what the New World Order is going to be. But you're all going to find out that you are the victims, victims of people who have a hidden agenda. And most of your preachers and uh, ministers who are teaching you this crap and feeding it to you are members of these secret societies, and they are promoting Zionism. Zionism. For behind Zionism is not Jewish folks. It's not the Jewish people. They're being used. They're going to be sorry that they're allowing themselves to be used. For behind the Zionist movement are the British Israelis. The people who believe that they are the master race, that they are the lost 13th tribe of Israel, that they are the people who are going to inherit the world and the rest of us are going to be their slaves. And if you don't believe that, you just listen. Don't go away. I'll be right back. And ladies and gentlemen, if you'll check your history, you'll find in the accounts left by the Romans, <clears throat> as they sent their legions up into Europe to conquer the Celts, the Picts, the Gauls, and the Germanic tribes, they describe very clearly what they found there. And what they found, ladies and gentlemen, was nothing that even remotely could ever be misinterpreted as any remnant of any of the tribes of Israel. It is clear what they found were primitive tribesmen. Some of them were gentle and not warlike and were easily conquered by the Romans. They had no root of Hebrew in their language, period. None of them anywhere. Most of them, however, were fierce tribesmen, many of whom went into battle naked, covered with mud, screaming like banshees and had no mercy for anything. Their women would come along behind them and pick whatever was worth anything off the bodies of the dead. And there are accounts that they would even eat parts of the bodies of their slain enemies. The Germanic tribes were so fierce and so primitive and so pagan that the Roman legions were constantly on battle at that frontier and never did completely conquer the Germanic tribes. The Celts, what were known as the Gauls, what were known as the Picts, most of them were conquered by the Romans. Some of them were incorporated into the Roman Empire and paid taxes to the Romans. All of this is on record. Of course, the Romans brought their religion into those regions and coupled with the pagan religions of those peoples, new legends and new myths, new metaphors began to evolve. And eventually, as the Roman Empire became the Catholic Church and the Roman Emperor became the Pope, the Catholic religion was introduced and mixed with many of these legends and fables and metaphors. And in many of these places, strange tales and legends grew up as they struggled to interpret the new religion from the new Bible. They began to create legends, stories that never happened and were never recorded before that time in their history, nor in the history of the Romans in their interaction with them. Now, 
These legends did not become prominent, and nobody paid any attention to them, and you will not find any record of them until the Normans gained power in England. When the Normans gained power in England, the secret societies began to front for the Norman cause. And a whole legend was created, and scriptures were found to back it up, that the Anglo-Aryan race was the lost 13 tribe of Israel. None of it stands up under any scrutiny, either historically or scripturally. But I hear on the radio, and I see and read in pamphlets and books, all of the bent and warped scriptures and references and the out-and-out -out lies of the history that try to convince people to back this up. Because this will carry you into the New World Order. And whether you realize it or not, any of you who cling to this and promote it are promoting the New World Order. You are helping to destroy the United States of America, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights and freedom for all of us. And you had better get your head on straight and quit listening to those who are misleading you. It is a heady wine to think that you are somehow better than others. That you are a master race destined to rule the world. And that when Christ comes, you will be the chosen people and everyone else will bow to you. It is a lie, ladies and gentlemen. And when you front those ideas and when you espouse those beliefs, you are in effect, if you are a Christian, calling Jesus Christ a liar. And I suggest you go back and read his words. For he never made any distinction between classes of people. He never rejected anyone, nor did he run after anyone who passed his teaching on the road and tried to force his teaching down their throat. It never happened. Never, not once. He accepted anyone who came to him, no matter their race, their color, or their creed. No matter their station in life, whether they were a prostitute or a nobleman, it made no difference to Jesus Christ and his, his formula for acceptance into the kingdom of heaven was simply this. Whomsoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. He did not say, whomsoever is a British Israelite shall have everlasting life. He did not say, whomsoever is black shall have everlasting life. He did not say, whomsoever is a Jew shall have everlasting life. He did not say, whomsoever is an Anglo-Aryan shall have everlasting life. And you had better understand that those who are manipulating you and teaching you these lies are heading you for a fall. For there is no master race, never was, and never will be. Of course, if you're not a Christian, then this doesn't make much difference to you. But it is a manipulation that comes out of the heart of the mysteries that came from ancient Babylon and were twisted on the continent and in England to promote a hidden agenda. And I quote, ladies and gentlemen, from the book entitled The Teachings of the Masters, written by Reverend Dr. R. Swineburne Clymer, who was the Director General of the Church of Illumination, the Supreme Grand Master of the International Confederation of Initiates of the OTO, of the Golden Dawn, of Freemasonry, of the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templar, the Supreme Grand Master of the merged occult fraternities comprising the Priesthood of Ife, the Rosicrucian Order, the Secret Schools, the Hermetic Brotherhood, Fraternitas Rosicrucius, the Temple of the Rosy Cross, the Order of the Magi, Sons of Isis and Osiris, Illuminati Americani, which translated means the American Illuminati, and this book was published by the Philosophical Publishing Company of Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, in 1952. The source of this information is from the 68th Convocation of the Rose Cross Order, to which all of the high-ranking members of the various orders and fraternities of what is known by the Brotherhood as the Illuminati, or the Brotherhood of Man, internationally as the International, 
1916 at Beverly Hall. And I quote verbatim, and you had better listen, because this is the source of your teachings. And it will be the hard core of the new world religion. It is already pervasive in the New Age movement, and it is very easily checked. I quote, the source of the mystical teachings of the New Testament could offer no other interpretation of the symbolism of the young republic than the ancient pyramid, its copestone and glory, significant of the descent of the New Jerusalem for the one side, and the eagle and the ever-repeating thirteen of Manasseh, thirteenth, or lost, torn away tribe of Israel, and the son of Joseph, the Britons, who was separated from his brethren in Egypt, in the parting asunder of northern Israel from southern Judah. Now, historically, Judah was never a part of Israel, and that's why they say here, northern Israel from southern Judah, because Judah was never a part of Israel. And if they made it sound as if Judah, a part of Israel, separated itself from the whole, then they could be found historically incorrect, so they tell the truth. The parting asunder of northern Israel from southern Judah, never again to become part of Judah, and the first to cross Europe in the search of the legendary isles afar off, to re-establish the ancient Gentile throne of Israel at Tava in Ireland. Now it is significant that they separate the name Israel into three syllables, Israel, with dashes. It stands for Isis, Ra, who is represented as Osiris, and El. El means God. The hitherto rejected reverse side of our great seal is now in full view of these United States. It is to remind the people that from the beginning they were called to a great work as offspring of a mighty Manasseh whose history began in Genesis and will culminate in America, and by whose stripes the world must be healed and will be healed, despite the many and inglorious betrayals of those who have set themselves up as the leaders of the peculiar people of the eagle. The legend tells us that Joseph, betrayed as we have often been, and cast off by his own people, married the daughter of the priest of the temple of On in Egypt. Now remember, if you've listened to this program, you know that On is another name for the sun, or Osiris, or the light, or Lucifer. They're saying that Joseph, as the legend tells, and it is a legend, it is not historical fact, never was and never can be, for it is a lie. The legend tells us that Joseph, betrayed as we often been, have been, and cast off by his own people, married the daughter of the priest of the Temple of On in Egypt. Today, as an eternal symbol until the time of the placing of the copestone upon the pyramid, one pillar of that ancient temple stands in London while its mate stands in New York. It is the Phallus of Osiris, the obelisk. There is also one in the outer courtyard of the Vatican, and one stands in Dealey Plaza. One also stands on the estate grounds of the Priory de Sion, or the House of Sion in England. These are vivid and should be constant reminders to us of our unbreakable connections with ancient Egypt and with Europe, and our father Joseph as an Anglo-Saxon culmination. As a result of this union and between these two pillars must all the world in biblical language pass into Ephraim or Shiloh. Professor Tutton, an eminent symbologist, understood these ancient mysteries fully and indicated this in his statement, quote, The whole Bible is written in the stars, both the law and the gospel, while esoterically the entire story of man is set forth upon the sea of Manasseh. The obverse side is Israel. Under the new covenant, as the hope and outcome victory of Christianity, the two sides reflect each other and cannot be separated, unquote. And that is the meaning of the new covenant that Clinton espouses. For he also is a member. This was displayed dramatically in the photograph published worldwide, where he stood in the Oval Office holding up a single red rose. Castro has been photographed holding up a single red rose, as has been Gorbachev, the leader of France, and the Queen of England. 
There is a possibility of England's betrayal and by forces within in which event America would be compelled to stand alone. This possibility, I probability, was clearly indicated in the poem ascribed to Merlin of King Arthur's Court on the constellation of the Thirteen Stars. And we'll get into that right after this break. Ladies and gentlemen, you see, this country has been betrayed by the Tories, who never wanted to separate from England in the first place. The body of the Illuminati around the world are working toward one world government, and if this Anglo-Aryan faction has its way, they will rule the world through a council of elders. If the Vatican has its way, the Pope will sit upon the throne of the world. Backing up one paragraph, I quote again, There is a possibility of England's betrayal and by forces within, in which event America would be compelled to stand alone. This possibility, I probability, was clearly indicated in the poem ascribed to Merlin of King Arthur's court on the constellation of the Thirteen Stars. Here they attribute truth to legend. Supposedly, Merlin said, quote, When the cock shall woo the dove, mother and child shall cease to love. When the cock shall guard the eagle's nest, the stars shall rise in the west. Then seven and six shall make but one, the lion's might shall be undone. Here they attribute to a mythical figure, Merlin, a prophecy which they say is being fulfilled in the world. Quote, when the cock, or France, shall woo the dove, which they say is America, mother and child shall cease to love. In other words, rebellion of her colonies against England. When the cock, France, shall guard, in other words, France's aid to the eagle's nest, which is the United States, or America, the stars, which they say are our constellation of thirteen, shall rise in the west. Then seven and six shall make but one, e pluribus unum, is their interpretation, and the lion's might shall be undone. This prophecy has been rapidly coming to pass since the Second World War. The English, the Anglo-Saxons, have permitted enemies within her borders, many of her, her own race, to gain control of her finances and institutions and replace what might be correctly termed Druidic Christianity, and that's exactly what it is. It is a perversion of true Christianity. In fact, when you hear what it really consists of, you will discover, ladies and gentlemen, that it is not Christianity at all but the remnant of the old pagan Druidic and Germanic and Gaul religion mixed with a little mixture of Christianity using this lie, this legend of Joseph to make them in to a master race. These are the same people who just prior to World War II attempted, attempted to turn England into an ally with Hitler. You see, Druidic Christianity is a godless atheism, really. They say, unless the English wake up, the lion's might will certainly be undone, and the old saying, there always will be in England, will be proven unfounded. The stars upon our seal are set in the form of a six-pointed star, or the double triangle, symbolic of the perfectly balanced man. After the downfall of Egypt, this was called Solomon's Seal, and that is a lie. It was never called Solomon's Seal until it was adopted by the Jewish people as their symbol sometime in the 16th century, ladies and gentlemen. They say, but the ages before that it had its place in the temples of the greater mysteries, and that is true. That's exactly where it comes from indicating that the physical man and the spiritual man had attained equilibrium, and that the Son of Man had indeed become the Son of God. Now, bear in mind that that is a, not a reference to Jesus Christ. At each point of the star was placed the symbol of an order, which symbolized arcane wisdom. And because of the presence upon the altar, within, no man might enter into the Holy of Holies, our innermost chamber, with safety to himself, save he who had attained to philosophic initiation. And that is the true definition of Solomon's temple within the Masonic lodges and the lodges of all of these other liars and deceivers. 
for the Temple of Solomon that they discuss has nothing to do with the Christian religion or the Jewish religion, but lies within each of them according to their own definitions. I continue. The special or spiritual symbol of America, aside from the pyramid and eagle, is the white rose, identical in its meaning to the white stone of legend and primitive masonry. For the meaning and the history of the white rose, study the War of the Roses, and you will find your eyes opened as to who is really behind this and what it really means. I continue, the constellation of 13 stars was an early drawing set in a wreath of white roses showing that the early designers were fully aware of future American individual spiritual development, and that is a lie. Our forefathers were not a part of this. They are the ones who broke away from England, ladies and gentlemen. This is a perversion of their beliefs. They certainly were members of the secret societies and the Illuminati, and they were working toward the great work of one world government, but not under Anglo-Aryan rule. You see, our forefathers truly believed in their day of the brotherhood of man, meaning all man, at some point in the future, standing upon an equal keel at birth and making for themselves what they will through individual responsibility. They really wanted this nation to succeed, but they knew in their hearts, because they understood human nature very well, that we would abdicate our responsibilities and our freedoms and would become slaves, and they would have to institute some kind of government to control the mob. Their aim was to topple the churches and states that existed in their world, and bring about a true freedom of mankind, hoping that this would be it, but giving us all the tools to either make the experiment succeed or fail, for man should, they believe, and I believe also, get what he deserves. The design is now drawn in white clouds, showing that the spiritual nature of America is beclouded, or under a cloud for the moment. These clouds are shadows symbolizing the confusion of the present era, will gradually be replaced by bright sunshine, symbol of light, enlightenment, clear perception, and understanding. Solomon's temple was the design of the perfect man. Perfection is the ultimate of every man, unless he chooses ignoble defeat. The Bible, like the arcane teachings of the greater mysteries, tells us of the three-cornered copestone which was prepared to finish the pyramid and the temple, but was rejected and later became the headstone of the corner. Genesis tells us of one Joseph, the keeper of the stone of Israel, and I might remind you that Isis was also called the stone. It was because of the Magian or Holy Grail teachings that the Britons crossed Europe to Ansareth, land of betrothal. They quote Esdras 11-13. Folks, can you find a book of Esdras in the Bible? Of course not. They will quote anything that furthers their perversion and their lie. They say they crossed... Europe to Ansareth, land of betrothal, in search of a land where they might keep God's worship pure and undefiled. Hence, through Joseph, who was separated, cast out, or sold by his brethren, we inherited the white stone of all Israel, the copestone of the pyramid, and of Solomon's temple, that rock upon which the initiate Nazarene reminded Peter he should build God's church. <laughs> oh my, oh my. The rock or foundation of spiritual unfoldment within each individual and against which in the ultimate the gates of hell should not prevail. What this true church really is, is made plain in, quote, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now they call Christ the Christos. Be formed means awakened in their language, and they reference Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. The one single word offers us the key to the entire mystery of the church and of man's ultimate goal. To travail is to suffer in giving birth. This birth is in or within us. It is the, quote, unless ye are born of the Spirit as ye have been of your mother's womb, unquote, you shall in no wise be able to enter the kingdom of heaven of biblical and mystical lore. 
This being the law which governs the universe as it governs the drama of heaven, which is the old cosmology worshipped at places like Stonehenge, it was in keeping that an Englishman, a master of heraldry, should give to the young republic during its struggle to separate from the mother country, as does the child from its mortal mother, the design for not only the work of the true Christic, our Christos Church, I refer you to the Christic Institute, which just is another branch of these perversions, but also the design for the great seal, which would express the whole future of the new country's work as a world leader and exponent of the teachings of the new church and of the Holy Grail. The all-seeing eye, looking down upon the ancient pyramid, symbolizes America, the eaglet of eagle land, and all she is to mean to the world. If she does not permit herself to be betrayed by the degrading and destructive ideologies of decadent European and Asiatic countries and utterly selfish, traitorous leadership in our own country. This emblem, the eye, is as ancient as man's appearance upon the earth, being found upon the Egyptian, Greek, and Chaldean monuments. And I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, they knew that it meant America back in those days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just keep thinking that, fools. This is beyond understanding how intelligent people can fall for these scams and be so manipulated by someone who comes along, flashes some kind of a certificate that he went to some kind of a school that taught him how to understand the Bible, and he preaches this perversion, and people fall right into line and believe it as fact, simply because this person told him to. If you follow them around long enough, you will follow them to the doors of the lodge of one of these secret societies, I can assure you. This emblem, the eye, is as ancient as man's appearance upon the earth, being found upon the Egyptian, Greek, and Chaldean monuments, while the Arabians looked upon it and named it the highest and holiest name of God, and with hushed voices whispered, I am that I am. And that is what Elizabeth Clare Prophet preaches in Montana. The triangle about the eye stood from the most ancient days as the emblem of the Trinity. Now get this, folks, because this is what their Trinity really refers to. The triangle about the eye stood from the most ancient days as the emblem of the Trinity, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, progenitors of humanity, father, mother, and the mother they call the Holy Ghost, and son. It is the seal of the eternal law of the three of the universe, and the watchful guide to those who awaken and walk in the light. Quote, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Unquote. Psalms 32, verse 8. The legend, symbolized by the pyramid, is esoteric, given in numbers, measures, and weights. In these may be read the history of ages already completed and the prophecy of those yet to come. I refer you to ICE, the ultimate Disaster, 5-5-2000. That's the name of the book, 5-5-2000, Ice, the Ultimate Disaster, by Richard Noon. I'll refer you in that book specifically to the interview with Tom Ballantyne, where he parrots this exact same philosophy. I also refer you to his book about uh, the pyramids, I forget the name of it, and his other book, The Late Great I'm sorry, The Life and Death of Planet Earth. I was thinking of a book written by Hal Lindsey. But Valentine's book is The Life and Death of Planet Earth. You'll find this same philosophy espoused throughout. And you will find him on Radio Freemasonry, running you around in circles, chasing your tails, even now. Throughout the past ages, each with its leader runs the legend of the stone kingdom cut out without hands. Now remember, throughout all past ages, this legend, this story, this perversion has been repeated throughout the pagan religions since the beginning of time when man first looked up and equated the sun with the power of God. The inner kingdom of heaven. The last and greatest of all might have been the master Nazarene had he not been betrayed by his own people, as in England, the land of Joseph, and the Grail being betrayed today. 
Notice, when it comes to the Nazarene who was of Israel being betrayed, all of a sudden, he's been betrayed by his own people. But his own people are no longer these people, you see. That's blamed on the Jews. But yet they claim to be of the tribe of Israel. What hypocrites, what liars, what deceivers, what perverters, what manipulators. Unless Americans in rapidly increasing numbers become imbued with the spirit of America and awaken to the Christic Church, and I refer you to the Christic Institute, run by another secret society, the Jesuits, a similar fate may also befall America. Ancient architecture, heraldry, and the drama of heaven are all telling the people of America of their possible destiny, material, and spiritual, no less than their responsibility. They're claiming that the Bible is recorded in the constellations of the heavens. The opposite is true, folks. The cosmology of the heavens in the ancient pagan religions existed long before the Bible was ever written. The Bible is a conglomeration of all of the metaphors and myths and religions of history passed down by word of mouth and written particularly the ones adhered to by the Hebrew race. As the head, body, and limbs of the great image, made of different metals, represented each messianic age, a new interpretation of truth, and an empire directly relating to some manifestation of that truth, so must America represent the white stone, and be a nation fashioning itself according to the divine pattern until it shall have attained to the messiahship. In other words, they're saying America is the messiah. Spiritual leadership. According to them, Christ is coming back to the earth, but not in a physical body, and he never was a divine human being, God incarnate in the flesh on this earth. Instead, it's an office that can be held by anyone, and in the new age, it shall be held by the new root race. In other words, they say that America represents the white stone, and it should be a nation fashioning itself according to the divine pattern until it shall have attained to the messiahship, spiritual leadership over all nations, overshadowing all that has preceded it. Quote, this cannot be accomplished until each citizen shall throw aside the veil of ignorance and superstition and see no longer as through a glass darkly, but face to face. When Judah shall no more be permitted to vex Israel, nor Israel envy Judah, but labor in harmony that the Lord's law be fulfilled. If this be not done, both may be destroyed as have been many nations before them. Remember the symbol of royalty in England and of England itself is the lion. It was also the symbol of the tribe of Judah and it was the symbol of ancient Babylon, in particular Nimrod, the hunter. I continue, the time spoken of by Isaiah, the prophet, has come. It is a time when the learned intellectual cannot read the book because it is sealed as Greek to them, nor the unlearned because he is unlettered. Yet shall the book be unsealed because the ancient arcane wisdom applies to the individual who is willing to work in obedience to the cryptic law in his personal quest of the Holy Grail. In drinking of the cup of unselfishness, in his love for his neighbor and the stranger within his gates, in his loyalty to his family and his country, and his stubborn but holy insistence that destiny's prophecy shall not be set aside. So on the one hand, they talk about the brotherhood of man, about equal rights for all, about love for his neighbor and the stranger within his gates, the loyalty to his family and his country, and at the same time, these lying, deceiving manipulators are destroying the country. They're destroying the family. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, this comes out of the mysteries and nowhere else. And they believe that they are the master race and will ultimately destroy all other races and prevail as the rulers of the world. And yet they read this, they write this, and they see no contradictions. 
which makes most of them fools, in my estimation. In any case, they are liars, deceivers, and manipulators, the scum of the earth. They are the destroyers. Each and every one may be the fortunate heir to this glorious inheritance, but must seek the white stone which crowns the pyramid within himself by the full development of his body, mind, spirit, and soul, the holy trinity of each son of man who has become the son of God. And there is the clue to what they intend. Man will become God. Man himself will become Christed, and that is what they mean by the return of Christ to this earth. Not a physical man of divine origin, God incarnate in the flesh, coming on the clouds, as the Bible describes, but man himself will become Christed. And as humankind becomes Christed, and the chafe is weeded out from the wheat, which is them, and destroyed from the earth, all other races, they will prevail, and Christ will be upon the earth in them. It is in this manner that America will realize her destiny as the city set upon a hill, a star that shall never set, but become the light that shall light the world, because the true church of the eternal Christos, the Christ within man, for whom there is travail and birth until Christ be formed in you, man, shall have become established and be the sanctuary for all her people. This is what the Mormon church teaches. It is just another branch of Mystery Babylon, perverted, perverted by this hidden agenda of the master race, the Anglo-Aryan master race, incarnate in British Israelism, world Zionism, and if you're Jewish, you had better reject it. It's not about saving or preserving the state of Israel. It's about creating a one-world government and Orthodox Jews along with fundamentalist Christians or any Christian for that matter who will not renounce Christ as a divine incarnate of God in the flesh upon this earth. Any follower of the prophet Mohammed, anyone who will not bow down to this new religion will be destroyed. Will be destroyed. The state is the edifice. The church must be the spirit. This is the old Nazi coming back to us. This is national socialism on a world scale. For the state is the edifice. The church must be the spirit. The rise and fall of nations and people has been in exact ratio to their acceptance of the laws interpreted by their great spiritual leaders or their efforts to think, desire, and act in attempted defiance of them. This is the combination of British Israelism. It is what brought Hitler to power. It is the same occult philosophy that Hitler worshipped of the master Aryan race. We use the term attempted for the reason that though uncountable millions have made every effort to live outside of the law, none have thus far succeeded and all have passed into the limbo of things forgotten. This illustrates the trite, well-known old saying, the mills of the gods grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the world as a whole had come to a sorry pass. Selfishness was rampant. God was all but forgotten. Men lived by greed and at the expense of one another. The few were the masters, spiritual and material of the many. And only a few were able to recognize the light of God. It was a time very much like our own today when selfishness and desire for conquest were the ruling passions. Some of you old enough may recognize the ravings of Father Coughlin. Then, as always happens, in exemplification of the eternal law, there came one who was to walk upon the shores of Galilee, a just and honorable man, for they attribute no divinity to Christ. One without selfish motive, one who did not seek to establish an earthly kingdom, but instead a heavenly kingdom on earth in which all who so desired and were willing to make the effort might enjoy the good things of earth. Do you hear that? He talked of God as none other had before him. He proclaimed God to be the Father of all creation, the supreme being of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth, and of man in his own image. This young man, this native of Galilee, the Nazarene, preached the fatherhood of God and the possibility, not the certainty, of the brotherhood of man and the immortalization of the soul of man. 
this master teacher manifested greater love, more wisdom, and courage than had ever before been found embodied in the body of any man. He possessed the desire to serve mankind as had none other before him. He taught the simplest, grandest, and most sublime doctrine or concept of life that ever fell from human lips. Yet despite the services he was ready and willing to render to his fellow men and the soul-inspiring doctrine he taught, the people of his day, except for a very few, misconstrued his teachings, ridiculed his concepts, and finally crucified him. The great Galilean was wise. His wisdom and understanding were beyond the comprehension of the men of his day, because then as now, simplicity had no power to excite or incite. Only the complex holes men enthralled, foreseeing the things that were to come, he prepared the way, so that, should his ministry and teachings be rejected, they would be preserved and passed on to a succeeding age. The age is now upon us, the new age, when man shall become the Son of God. Good night. And God bless you all. And may God have mercy upon your soul.